we've been doing a series of presentations on the American West. And uh, last week we talked about the railroads. And we talked about how the railroad came West and just totally transformed uh, the area. One of the areas that it really transformed was the way in which we eat. Uh, I don't know how many of you realize it, but before the era, which we now re really refer to as a cowboy era, about the period from about 1865 to 1890, uh, the people in America ate a lot different than what we eat today. Uh, red meat was really uh, something that was not on most people's diets. Most people in the East ate uh, pork, they ate a lot of chicken, ate a lot of mutton, but they didn't eat a lot of beef. And the reason, of course, was because uh, it takes a lot of land to raise a beef cattle. Uh, and it was there, there really wasn't that much land available to raise beef. And so it really wasn't until the railroad went west and it was feasible to bring cattle back east. And at first uh, that was done in mass. They would load the cows up into boxcars and take them east. And eventually uh, they got where there were stockyards out in the west and they would butcher the cattle there and take the beef raw into the town. So that's what we're gonna look at today because the railroad locomotive actually brought about what we generally recall as the heroic age of the cowboys. And today we're gonna to concentrate on the cattle trails and the cow towns. And then next week, we're actually gonna talk about <clears throat> the life of the cowboy. So I always start my presentations with a painting. And today uh, we're looking at a painting by a man by the name of Joe Beeler. And he painted a painting called the uh, Along the Chisholm Trail. Very beautiful painting, shows a typical cowboy scene. So the heroic age, I don't know how many were tuning in then or how many remember, but way back when we first started this presentation, the very first day, I told you how that the American West, particularly this period between 1865 and 1890, is what we call America's heroic age. It's a period that's dominated by heroes and villains, usually was pretty short lived. And yet the effect upon the country's history was really disproportionate for that time. This, this is a period of time when so many people know, you know, you can go out on the street today and you can ask people of almost any age, do you know who Wyatt Earp was? Do you know who Wild Bill Hickok was? Do you know who Billy the Kid was? Do you know who Jesse James was? And, and they may not know a lot about them, but they all know these people. Uh, it, it's just, it's part of our iconic uh, history. So the period became almost larger than life. It almost became legendary. And as I said, this period lasted only for about 25 years. Uh, you would think that it lasted a lot longer than what it did, but it was really pretty short lived. It was dominated by cowboys, outlaws, lawmen, uh, and these people actually kind of crossed over uh, from one, one area to the next pretty easily. Uh, outlaws became lawmen, lawmen became outlaws, cowboys might be either one of them in the long run. So it was, a, you know, it was more of a circular type thing than a linear type thing. And it all came about because of a nasty tempered animal running wild in Texas the Longhorn. So here's a photograph of some early cowboys. This is, uh, I subscribe to a magazine <clears throat> about American West history. And I've got an issue where it has the 100 most historic photos of the American West. And this is one of them. And it says in there that this is probably the most accurate historical representation of a cowboy that you will ever find. Uh, this is what they look like, folks, with maybe one exception. You notice that they're all white. Actually, cowboys were a very diverse group. Uh, one in six 
was either a Mexican or a black uh, or sometimes an Indian. Uh, they were a very diverse group and, and they actually got along pretty well on the range. Uh, you know, everybody depended on everybody else. Uh, you know, there's no saying in the military. There's no races in foxholes. And it was kind of that same I'm way so amongst sorry. the cowboys. Hello? You're so not on this chair. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but we can't see your screen if you're sharing something. Okay. Well, I don't know what's happened here. Uh, Try um, where it says share screen. Okay, can you see? Can you see me now? We can see you. But you can't see my. Okay. Your presentation. We, we. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what the problem is. I I I was not getting any of the little. Uh, hmm. You know, they've changed Zoom around. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> uh, review. Mm -hmm. Yeah, click on that part where it says share screen. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that, Kayla. Um, You're having the, issues like with the me? bottom where it says share screen. Okay. Yeah, every time I put on my PowerPoint, it seemed like I lose the. Uh... Hmm. Um, it's not you do anything if you go to share screen. Uh, I can. I can see my little screen and I can see. Uh, yeah, because all we can see is you, so we're not seeing your point. Okay, so can, can you see the screen at all? We just see your face. You can see me, but you can't see my PowerPoints. Right. Hmm. Well, that's not good. Uh, hmm. What happens when you hit share screen? I'm sorry? What happens when you hit share screen? Uh, my PowerPoint comes up, but I lose all my little, um, I lose all the, the uh, gallery view. Like right now, mm -hmm. I can see all the people up and see you, but if I put on PowerPoint, it goes just to my PowerPoint. Do you want to try that and see if we can yeah, at let least me try still it again. see it? I'm okay. Bye. I don't know what's going on. How's that? Hang on. Does that work? Oh, it was... Yep, can we you got see it, me? Tony. Can you you're see good. It? Yeah, can we you can see, see me it. and the PowerPoint. Okay, okay. Whew. I don't know what was going on. <laughs> okay, so. Let me think about where we were here. <laughs> okay. So, as I was saying, it was all brought about by this nasty tippered thing called a longhorn. Uh, move this thing up here. I've still got, hmm. Okay, sorry about this. We're having technology problems today, it seems like. So anyway, uh, the Spanish actually brought the Longhorn into America. Um, 
And when they brought them here, the uh, the cattle were brought here, as you know, since they had used a lot of it. And uh, you know, they really fit in well with Mexico. Uh, the warm weather, the lush grass, they multiplied very rapidly. Uh, Twenty years later, Coronado, when he did his expedition up, up to the southwest, herded about 500 of these wiry cattle up with him. And some of them escaped. And as a result, they begin to multiply into what we now know as Texas, New Mexico, Arizona. And uh, they were just everywhere. Uh, they were just uh, continually part of, of the landscape. So by the time Texas came around and won its independence, became a state, there were so many longhorns running loose in Texas. There was actually estimated about six for every Texan. There were literally hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of longhorns. Nobody owned them. They were just running loose. Uh, and this is a typical Texas longhorn, as you can see here. Uh, pretty nasty tempered beast. But, uh, you know, the meat was really good, or at least we Americans think so. Uh, as I said, the, uh, <clears throat> the Europeans, even yet today, there's only one country out of the top 50 red meat eaters that are in Europe. And that's, believe it or not, the country is Switzerland. I'm not sure how that happens. But Switzerland, they still eat red meat. But most of the countries of Europe, they do not eat red meat. Uh, we're, we're one of the uh, one of the largest producers and, you know, uh, one of the people that use more of it than anywhere else. Now, here was a problem. You had all these longhorns running out, out west. And, you know, as the Civil War ended, there began to be a desire for red meat. Uh, people, their taste changed. Uh, they became wealthier. The population increased, they got further away from their European roots, and as a result, there began to be a demand for beef. The problem was, how do you get it to the east? Uh, some Texans, as early as the 1840s, tried shipping them back east through railroad traffic, I mean through uh, ship traffic from New Orleans, but that was really uh, expensive and wasn't very easy to be done. On top of that, who would want to clean those ships? Can you imagine how dirty those things were? Whew, man, I can't even imagine. Uh, by about 1852, there was a guy in Illinois, a man by the name of Tom Candy Ponting. And he thought, you know, maybe if I went down to Texas and bought a bunch of these beef, I could drive them east and I could make some money. So he decided to try an experiment. He went down east. And, uh, you know, he bought some of these beef and he ended up driving them all the way back to New York City, believe it or not. Now, at the time, it looked like a failure, but actually it started the whole era of the cattle drive. Uh, and as soon as the railroad came around, it made it a lot more feasible. This is a photograph of Tom Pointing Candy. Tom, pardon me, Tom Candy Pointing. He's the guy that kind of got the cattle drive thing all going. Uh, here's, here's the story of his drive. It's really an amazing story. He left Illinois in 1852 in search of cattle to drive back east. Went down to the Red River in Texas, bought 700 head of cattle, and started driving them up through Baxter Springs, Kansas, through Springfield, Missouri, to St. Louis. I could look out my window right here, and I could see exactly where he drove those cattle, because he drove them up from the uh, what was called the old wire road then through Springfield and from there on what was called the Kickapoo Trace all the way to St. Louis. Uh, so the first cattle drive in American history came right through where I'm sitting. I mean, literally uh, within probably a few hundred yards of where I'm sitting, the first cattle drive came through. Uh, most people in this area don't even know that, but it, that's happened. Uh, that winter, they fattened them in Illinois. And they, they put them on a rangeland and they fattened them up through the winter. And then they herded them on to, uh, I believe, Cincinnati. And from there, they put them on a railroad car, shipped them all the way into New York City, 
drove them down Wall Street. Can you imagine that? Uh, you know, the center of the New York stock market today. They drove these cattle all the way down through Wall Street to the stockyards, which was on the uh, harbor front of New York City at that time. And, you know, it was a two year drive over 2,100 miles, and yet they still made a 400% profit. But everybody said, I don't want to spend two years of my life driving a bunch of nasty cattle all the way to New York City. So it was an experiment. It worked, but it wasn't feasible. So here is the Texas to New York cattle drive. Start all the way in Texas, all the way up through Baxter Springs, Springfield, St. Louis, uh, all the way into Indiana and uh, caught the railroad, shipped it around like this to New York City. Uh, quite, a, quite a feat, to say the least, but it just wasn't a practical feat. Well, some people nevertheless saw that there was going to be a market for beef. They said, we, you know, some people, the entrepreneurs, the people that always get on the, you know, the, the top rail, the ones that know what's coming, they're the ones that make the money. Uh, and so there were people in Texas, particularly, that began to gather up these longhorns and basically established ranches. One of them was a member of the name of Richard King. Richard King and came west during the Mexican War and operated a steamboat on the Rio Grande River. And uh, he had made a fortune, I mean, supplying the soldiers and the, and the Texians. So, you know, he really made a bunch of money. He made so much that he actually was able to buy a really huge tract of land called the Santa, Santa Gertrudis Tract. I have a hard time saying that word, Santa Gertrudis Tract on the Nuches River. And uh, he added that to some land he already owned. And he started what became known as the King Ranch. And he began to gather up these wild longhorns and added more land and more land. And eventually, uh, he ended up owning the, few, the biggest land in Texas, ranch in Texas, one of the biggest ranches in the world, 875,000 acres. And here is the present day King Ranch. It's still in existence today. Up here, you would have Corpus Christi. And here's Padre Island, if you've ever been there, any of you. These are the four tracks of the present King Ranch, 875,000 acres. That's his little cottage that he built, you know, nice little house. And that's Mr. King himself. And like I said, you can still go to uh, South Texas and you can still visit the King Ranch. Uh, their brand was the Running W. You know, every ranch had a different brand and that was his, the Running W there. Okay. Uh, the next step in all this was the stockyards. Uh, at this time, the stockyards were primarily in the eastern part of the United States, but two men decided they saw what was happening, and they decided that they were going to start some stockyards and a meatpacking company in Chicago. A man by the name of Philip Armour and Gustavus Swift. Of course, those names are really familiar to us today, the Armour and the Swift Company. They're still two of the largest meatpacking companies in America. And these two guys started their companies the same year, uh, and they saw what was going to happen. Uh, Swift, by the way, invented the refrigerated railroad car, which actually made it even more easily to transport beef back east. Uh, but they were searching for supply. Now they needed beef to bring to the, uh, to the country back east. And so they begin to search and they begin to try to somehow get these Texas ranchers together with the meat packers in Chicago. So now we go looking for a way to bring these together, a shortened trail drive as such. Right now, at this time, 1865, the, the furthest west the railroad ran was Sedalia, Missouri. And that was where the, uh, you know, the, the railhead ran. And so that became kind of the, the first terminus of the first 
real big trail drive. This is Mr. Swift and Mrs. Mr. Armour, uh, two of the guys that started the meat packing business and got fabulously wealthy. So what they wanted to do was try to bring the beef north from Texas. Sedalia kind of got out of the picture pretty fast because they didn't like the beef coming over their land. And on top of that, uh, they were bringing ticks with them and they just didn't think that that was a very good thing. So they began to look for another place that they could herd the cattle. Of course, the railroad was moving westward the whole time. By 1867, a man by the name of Joe McCoy went to Abilene, Kansas, a little old village in the middle of Kansas, northern Kansas. And that was the furthest west that the Kansas Pacific Railroad had gone at that time. And he thought, you know, this is the perfect spot. It's sitting on the river. It's got lots of, uh, you know, uh, hay to feed the cattle. It's flat. The railroad's here. All I have to do is find a way now to get the cattle up from Texas to Abilene and I can make a lot of money. So he started looking for a trail. And as he found out, there was already one basically there. He didn't know it at the time, but he found it later. It's called the Chisholm Trail. I'll show it to you in a minute. And that summer, the first summer of 1867, McCoy shipped out 37,000 head of cattle to the east. And that was just the beginning, folks. Uh, and of course, Abilene became just the first of several of these wild west towns. This is what brought in the era of the wild west that we all remember from our youth when we used to watch Wyatt Earp and um, all these shows on TV, Rawhide and Wagon Train. Um, you can probably remember them all. Well, this is Abilene, Kansas, back in its infancy. You can see what it looked like here. So, the Chisholm Trail already existed. It was a merchant's trail. A man by the name of Jesse Chisholm had uh, established it some years before as a merchant's trail, hauling goods from Wichita, Kansas to Texas. All McCoy had to do was mark it out up to, North, up to Abilene, and he had a ready-made cattle trail. And as soon as he did that, the race was on. And over the next few years, uh, the ranchers from South Texas began to move north with their cattle during the summer, bringing them to Abilene, Kansas, putting them on the railroad cars and shipping them back east. And they did this by the hundreds of thousands. Uh, it was just huge. Uh, by 1870, there was over 300,000 cattle being shipped out of Abilene, Kansas. I mean, huge amounts of cattle. And here is the cattle trails. Now, this is the first one. This was called the Shawnee Trail here, all the way up to Sedalia, but that went out of, uh, they, they didn't use it very long. This was the Chisholm Trail. And you can see the Chisholm Trail basically first ended up in Abilene and went on to Ellsworth and Hayes City and Dodge City and several of these other trails. And then there became what's known as the Western Trail, all the way up uh, through Kansas all the way to Ogallala, uh, Nebraska. And then finally, you had the last major cattle trail was the Goodnight Loving Trail, all the way up to Cheyenne, Wyoming, and eventually all the way up into Montana. And I'm, I'll tell you a little bit more about the Goodnight Loving Trail in a minute because it's got a lot of uh, importance to it. But these were the major cattle drive trails for the next 25 years from 1865 to 1886, 1890 or so. This is, and then eventually what happened was the railroad got into Texas and there was no longer a need to drive them north. They would just put them on the railheads at Dallas and Fort Worth and uh, Houston and San Antonio. And there wasn't any need to drive them north like they were doing. That's kind of what ended the Wild West. By the way, here, Jesse Chisholm, he was part Cherokee uh, he was not a, you know, he was not uh, a full white man. And uh, his name is kind of synonymous now with the cattle trails of the Old West. 
Now, one of the offshoots of this was the Rip Roaring Cattle Town. Uh, you know, long before there was Las Vegas, you know, Sin City, you had Abilene and Dodge City and Hay City and Ellsworth and on and on and on. There were these cities that were basically just little spots in the middle of the prairie. But when the cowboys came to town, they absolutely transformed those towns into an unbelievable uh, sight to be seen. And Abilene was the first one of these wild west towns as such. Uh, when the cowboys ended their dry, they went looking for women, whiskey, and wild times, and they found them. You know, uh, there was always people there who were willing to take their money, and Abilene provided these pleasures. Unfortunately, what happened was things got so wild in Abilene that as the school teachers and the preachers and the moms and the children came to town, that they were no longer satisfied with this. They wanted it stopped. And so what happened was you begin, they begin to hire lawmen. Uh, one of the most famous, and we're going to talk about him later in a few weeks, was a man by the name of Wild Bill Hickok. And uh, he came to Abilene to restall, restore law and order. Of course, the way he did it was rough justice, to say the least. Uh, while Bill Hickok knew one way to restore law and order, and that was to shoot somebody. And, uh, you know, he was a pretty, a pretty violent man in his own right. But this was, again, just very typical of this time in these wild west towns. Eventually, as town like Abilene got settled by the preachers and the teachers and, and all these more Gentile folks, uh, they began to basically ask the cattle drive not to come there anymore. The railroad was headed west, and they no longer wanted them there. And so the cow towns just proceeded westward in the prairie. Uh, and so you had more of them, Ellsworth, Newton, Hay City, Wichita, uh, all of them. This is a painting by a man by the name of Andy Thomas. I love this painting. Uh, it's called, Oh, What We Seen in Abilene. Uh, and you can see the cowboys all sitting around the stage and they've got them a dancing girl up there and she's uh, obviously entertaining the cowboys and they're just all agog, you know. They, uh, they've they never seen anything like this. And I love that, Oh, What We Seen in Abilene, you know. So uh, a very good painting. Annie Thomas is a local painter, I think I've told you about before, that lives in Carthage, Missouri. And uh, he has a, become a nationally known painter, particularly of the Old West. And uh, you're going to see a lot more of Andy Thomas's paintings here in the next few weeks. Now, as I told you, the trails begin to move westward. One of them was the Goodnight Loving Trail. Uh, I bet a lot of you out there have seen Lonesome Dove. The miniseries that was there in the 80s, uh, it was, uh, you know, it talked about a couple of former Texas Rangers uh, that decided to move north to Montana and all the trials and tribulations that they went through going north. Uh, two Texas Rangers, men by the name of Woodrow Call and uh, Augustus McCray. These characters were based on a novel written by a man by the name of uh, Larry McMurtry, and he wrote uh, Lonesome Dove. He patterned his characters on Charles Goodnight and Oliver Loving. They too were former Texas Rangers, and they too started a ranch in South Texas and then finally ended up moving north into Wyoming and Montana. And uh, the whole concept of Lonesome Dove is based on Goodnight and Loving. And their trail became one of the most famous trails of the Old West. It was a little bit more dangerous than the Chisholm Trail and some of the other trails because um, it basically went through the desert parts of it. The Indians were a little bit more aggressive uh, in that part of the country. And uh, you also ran the risk of uh, uh, a lot more elements of weather like snow and all if you didn't get there in time. 
but the Goodnight Loving Trail became very famous and uh, proved to be one of the more profitable and also extended the cattle ranch era up into what we now call uh, Wyoming and Montana and Colorado and that area. Before it was centered primarily in Texas, now it began to move north and westward into, uh, you know, uh, these states. Uh, by the way, Loving didn't live very long. He was killed by Indians during uh, the cattle drive, which incidentally happened. If you've seen Lonesome Dove, you know that happened to Augustus McRae. And then uh, Goodnight continued ranching for a long time. Actually didn't die till the age of 93 in 1929. Uh, so he lived to be a very old man. Uh, so very interesting story. Without a doubt, if you were to pick one town that is synonymous with the Old West, it's Dodge City. Everybody has heard of Dodge City. Uh, if you've ever watched Gunsmoke, you know, Matt Dillon walks down the street and brings law and order, and you got the good hearted barkeep, Miss Kitty, and you got Doc, and you got Festus, and you got all these characters that roamed around our TV screens for almost 20 years. Uh, and Dodge City became synonymous with the cow town, the cattle town. And uh, it's by, without a doubt the most famous of all these towns. Uh, it actually started as a refuge for buffalo hunters in the 1870s. Uh, and uh, it, it never really tamed down. Uh, by the way, you can still go to Dodge City. Uh, Front Street has been recreated now and they have their daily... Uh, gunfight out on front of the front street and uh they've got of course it's a tourist attraction and all but it's still a pretty interesting place to to visit uh, during this time you had people like Wyatt Earp, Doc Holliday, Clay Allison, John Wesley Harden and just about every other gunfighter wild west character known to mankind ended up one time or the other in Dodge City and we're going to talk about most of these over the next few weeks uh, Mark Twain said it was a town that had hair on it. I'm not exactly for sure what that meant. I guess it meant it was wild and woolly, you know, but uh, I know this, it was, a, it was a, a really rough town. Another painting by uh, my good friend, Andy Taylor, uh, and, and uh, it's called Hello Boys. And you can see the cowboys on their horses getting ready to go into the saloon, raising heck, you know. So uh, these guys were uh, ready to go in and have a good time. Uh, Dodge City was so influential in Western history that we have terms that have come down to us in the vernacular that first started in Dodge City. For instance, red light district. <laughs> Now, I know that may be shocking to some of you, but I bet you've all heard of red light districts. Well, this all came about in, in uh, Dodge City because uh, the most famous brothel in Dodge City had red lights in its windows, and it was called the Red Lighthouse. And as a result, that term became synonymous with uh, illicit districts in the town, you know, and a lot of big cities all had these red light districts. Boot Hill. Boot Hill is synonymous, of course, with, you know, a Western cemetery, and that was the name of Dodge City Cemetery, was Boot Hill, and now it's just a synonymous name. Other words, stinker, stiff, joint, all these terms came about out of Dodge City. So Dodge City played a really important part on our language as well as on everything else. Um, it was said that a man died in Dodge every morning before breakfast, and that's not too far from being true. Uh, again, it didn't last long, but it was, a, it was a pretty wild and crazy town. To stop the slaughter, the citizens employed a series of lawmen, as we talked about. Wyatt Earp came to town, Bat Masterson, Bill Tillman. You've maybe not heard as much about him, but he was really a very famous lawman. And by 1878, uh, Dodge City had pretty well tamed down and had been replaced by Tombstone, Arizona as the toughest town in America. 
And of course, Tombstone is where the most iconic gunfight of the Old West, uh, the gunfight at the OK Corral took place. And we're going to talk about that in a, in a future presentation. So here's Dodge City. This is what it looked like in the 1870s. Not much to see, but this is Front Street in Dodge City. So I always end up with a book and a movie. And no different today. A uh, few years back, a man by the name of Tom Clavin decided to write a trilogy of the Old West. And they're, they're histories. And the first one he wrote was Dodge City, White Earp, Bat Masterson, and the Wickedest Town in the American West. It's an excellent book. I've read it uh, when it first came out, and it's very well written, but it's easy to read. It's not a... It's not a history with footnotes and all. It's just a really good, easily readable book about Dodge City. The second book, uh, which you'll also uh, hear about in a little while, is called is about, about Wild Bill Hickok. Uh, it was not as good as Dodge City, but it wasn't bad. And then he wrote his last one just last year about Tombstone. And frankly, uh, to use a vernacular from Dodge City, it was kind of a stinker. It just didn't really work out too well. Uh, it was not a very good book. But this one is an excellent book. Of course, uh, what better miniseries or movie to watch about the cowboy era than Lonesome Dove? I mean, it, it doesn't get any better than this, folks. If you've never seen Lonesome Dove, you ought to try to watch it. It's long. It takes it's about six hours long, so you have to watch it in spurts. It's a mini series. It was broadcast over four nights, and it comes in four parts. But boy, is it good. It is just, it kind of resurrected the Western in the late 1980s. Uh, the Western had pretty well died out. And when Lonesome Dove came back, uh, people got all interested in the Western again. And you saw kind of a, a, a resurgence of Western in movies like well, Tombstone, uh, Dances of Wolves, The Unforgiven uh, with Clint Eastwood. So there were several movies made in the 90s that was a direct result of the popularity of Lonesome Dove. So I can't recommend it uh, highly enough. It's just an excellent, excellent story. So next week, we're going to talk about the cowboy himself. We're going we're gonna to look at the cowboy. Uh, what was his life like? Uh, you know, we had this romantic version of this, of this man with Victorian manners that uh, was, you know, doffed his hat at women and, uh, you know, led a really great life that all of us young boys always wanted to be. Everybody wanted to be a cowboy when I was a kid. Well, it wasn't quite that romantic. Uh, it was a pretty rough life. And we're going to look at the cowboy era. And then we're going to look at back kind of about how it all came to end. Uh, so 